Did that stress anybody else out with all you have to do today? You were just coming to church to concentrate. You thought this was a, a series about rest. And now it's like, oh yeah, taxes, walk the dog, pick up the kids. Well, hey, we spend so much of our lives giving it all we have. And we know we're going to get there someday soon. And yet, why is it that at the end of most days, we're completely exhausted and what we gave still wasn't enough? Do you know that feeling? Like, have you ever been in that zone where you are giving it all you have and they still give the promotion to someone else? You're giving it all you have because you know the bonus is out there if you hit the right target and you still don't get it. It's so disheartening when we give everything we can possibly give and we still don't get the recognition or the promotion or the satisfaction or the contentment. But let's go a step further. Sometimes we actually get what we had hoped to get and we still didn't gain contentment in the process. Have you ever been there? Now you have a problem. When you get everything you ever set your sights on, and because of my unique role here at Epic, I get to spend a lot of time with people who are in all kinds of spaces along life's journey and their faith journey and their work journey, and I've been able to be with a ton of people who, if you just saw what they got, if you just saw it on paper, you would be like, I bet that's the happiest man or woman in the world. And I'm here to tell you that's not always the case. I wish I could tell you it was usually the case. I can't even go there. And while we're exhausted and still not getting there, we crave rest. We crave renewal. We crave replenishment. But we tell ourselves we can only have permission to receive those things once we reach a certain point. And for whatever reason, we never quite reach that destination where we can give ourselves rest. We're running hard after something, but what exactly are we after? Sometimes we forget the point, don't we? Most of us, if you're the lazy person in the room, raise your hand and we'll you know, keep you as the exception. Most of us are running hard after something, but what exactly are we after? We're after something that will define us, something that will tell us that we're enough, something that will tell us that we made it. What we're really hustling for, so many of us, is a secure identity. There's a group of people, or maybe there's a person, or there's an industry, or there's a set of followers, and if we can just hustle enough, we will finally make it in their eyes. And if we make it in their eyes, we've made it. We've made it. So much of our hustle is due to our constant assumption that we lack something we need. By the way, if you're just tuning in, let me say this really strongly. We are all for hustling here. The right kind of hustle. We're all for hard work. In fact, we will come out of this series and do a sacred vocation series because we made a commitment a couple of years ago to talk about faith and work every single year. So we do an entire series built around that idea. So we are pro-work. If the team at Epic doesn't work, eventually they don't have a job. Okay, we, everybody did know that on the team, right? All right, so that's, you're like, oh, but you're a church. Yeah, well, they've got me for a boss. So, um, so we're all about hustling, but so many of us are hustling because we're trying to make up for something that's missing. And that's what I want to talk about as we begin today. In this series, The Soul Can't Hustle, I want to introduce you or perhaps reintroduce you to some key scriptures. And, and as I do that, in fact, Will did a great job last week, an amazing job. Go back and listen to week one. Will taught out of Jeremiah 6.16, which says from God, like, ask for the ancient way. If you take the path that I created you to take, you will find rest for your souls. But the text went on to finish by saying, but you would not take it. And I wish we could look back at those people in history and say, I can't believe they wouldn't do it. We're doing it so well. But I have to say to so many of us, God is offering us a path that we also refuse to take so often. 
And whenever you read scriptures that come out of this series, I don't primarily want you to think of these scriptures as commands, though they will be commands. I don't primarily want you to think about these scriptures we're going to read as theology, though anytime you're discussing who God is and what he's like, that's theology. I don't want you primarily to think of these scriptures as wisdom, though God is going to give us wisdom through what we learn. I primarily want you to receive these scriptures we're going to be in as invitation. An invitation to some path that most of us aren't actually on today. An invitation to choose an alternative way. An invitation to not do it like everyone else does it at your office or in the organization or in your industry or perhaps, unfortunately, even in our church. The first invitation I want to give you is out of Psalm 23. So if you have a Bible on you, you've got an app of some sort, not just any app, an app that actually has the Bible in it. Um, Stand with me and you can see the scripture on the screen as well. I'm going to read the first three verses of a really classic psalm. So classic, in fact, that if you've never been to church, there's a good chance you've heard Psalm 23 read in some uh, setting. Maybe it was a funeral. Uh, I can think back to even, uh, Sean and I, we don't watch a ton of shows that are like, you know, our shows, but over the last couple of decades, uh, we've been married just over 18 years, we've watched certain shows. I can remember even, um, anybody remember Lost? Anybody watch Lost way back in the day? Some of you who are 19, you're like, I'm lost right now, Ben. Um, <laughs> do yourself a favor. I'll tell you which seasons you should get in on. But I can remember um, just hearing, uh, I think the guy from Nigeria recite uh, Psalm 23. But here's what it says to, to start, just the first three verses I, w- I want to cover. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me, leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Now, don't have a seat just yet. So I told you this is the invitation. That's how I want you to perceive everything that you're hearing from the scriptures today. And I'm going to read it again in just a moment, but I already know some of you are ready to argue. Some of you, like this sounds lovely to all of us, doesn't it? Lacking nothing, having a shepherd to provide for your needs, leading you into green pastures, making you lie down, refreshing your soul, leading you beside the quiet waters, guiding you in the right path. Who doesn't want that? But already you're ready to argue with me. Ben, you don't know what my job is. Ben, you don't know what my level is. Ben, you don't know how young my kids are. True. Um, Ben, you don't know that we just started this company. I got it. Ben, you don't know what's expected of me to be partner. Ben, you just don't know. I may not know, but the God who promises to give you this invitation, he knows. And so hear it again as invitation, regardless of your gender, regardless of your age, regardless of where you are on the spiritual journey, what it is that you do for a paycheck or what it is you do in your volunteer time. The Lord is your shepherd. You lack nothing. He wants to make you lie down in green pastures. He would love to lead you beside quiet waters. He has a plan to refresh your soul. He wants to guide you along the right paths for the sake of his name. The question is, will you let him? That's an invitation. You may have a seat. So I hope that we would take this to heart. I mean, this is amazing, and it conjures up a vision that we're excited about, even if we can't see a way there ourselves. And some of you are thinking, I don't know who this David guy is that wrote the psalm, but he must not have accomplished much in his life. He must have not had to ever hustle. Go read his story. There's some hustling he did that you should not emulate, but that's a whole different (laughs) sermon series that we'll get to eventually. He should have been hustling out at war, and he was not. He was on t- anyway, <laughs> not for today. You know how we like to bring it at 12 o'clock. If you don't know, 12 o'clock is where it's at. I don't have a filter too much at the other two hours, but I have zero filter <laughs> at, at this one. Um, that sounds amazing as an invitation to us, but I want to share with you something that I think would be the case if we were rewriting these three verses based on how most of us are living. So I want to show you this on the screen. If we were just rewriting it based on how most of us are living and the culture that we observe around us, here's what we might write opposite of what we read. I am totally responsible for anything good that comes into my life. I lack so many things. I cannot lie down or take a day off. I need as much noise as possible in my life at all times. Refresh my soul? Ha! Huh. I need to refresh my resume, my Instagram account, and my LinkedIn profile. I must make a name for myself. I would love to have a conversation with us about how that's for all of those people who aren't a part of Epic Church. They should get better. But this is a conversation, and it's an invitation for us, right? And here's the thing about endlessly hustling. I'm not going to be the guy that stands up here and says, oh, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot. You won't get the promotion anyway. You won't get the raise. You won't get the corner office. You won't get the executive position. But endlessly hustling might get you all of those things. 
you might gain a lot with your endless hustle. But no matter how much you gain, you need to know that every gain in life means a loss of something else. Jesus said it this way in Mark 8, 36. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Which leads me to want to ask you a question that I hope you give considerable weight to. Here's the question I want to ask you. Wouldn't you rather gain a whole soul and forfeit some things in this world? Now, I know how you want to respond. You want to tell me, Ben, I want it all. We hate limitations. We hate making choices. We hate missing out. In fact, this whole idea of FOMO, I couldn't believe it, but in 2016, FOMO entered the Oxford Dictionary. Not just the Urban Dictionary. It's like a real thing now in Oxford. This fear of missing out causes us to endlessly hustle because we know if we can just do more and we make ourselves promises, if I just get to this point, then I will be satisfied. Some of you crossed that point a long time ago. Have you stopped your endless hustle? Don't answer. We know we're going to get there one day, but you can't have it all. Jesus says you really need to give considerable weight and choose. Do you want uh, an undivided soul, this whole or complete self, or do you want everything that the world promises to give you if you just will never stop the hustle? The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. I think this one belief could shift so much for us. It could shift so much in our minds and in our hearts. It could shift so much in our pace of living. It could shift things in our relationships because then we would be fully present to each other rather than saying to each other 16 times, would you say what you just said? Because I was checking this really important text. It could shift so much on our calendars. And here's the thing, I think, when you read in the text, he makes me lie down. I do believe that there are times, I have people in this room who I'm in relationship with, and I know there are times where God will take something away from them and make them lie down. But most of the time, God's going to give us the choice. But whatever you choose when it comes to your endless hustle or appropriate rest and that cycle way that God ordained it, you will have to live with the implications of your choice. And at the end of the day, you'll be able to blame it if you want to on your boss, on your industry, on 2019, on technology. You can blame it on anything that you want. But at the end of the day, will you have the whole world, or at least what you consider the whole world, or a whole self? Choose wisely. Choose wisely. John Kessler, in his book, The Radical Pursuit of Rest, lets us know why rest is especially challenging in today's modern world. He says this, Rest is harder to find in a digital culture because technology has dissolved the two fundamental boundaries that are essential to rest, solitude and silence. Now, how many of you, if you're holding your device in your hand, are listening to what I'm still saying? How many of you would go, yes, Ben, this delivers quiet waters for me? And I'm not talking about your noise-making app that helps you sleep. Ben, I've got quiet waters. I've got urban forests. I've got the rain. I've got the storm. I've got hummingbirds. Why would they put hummingbirds on something that's supposed to? How many times do you walk away from your interaction with your device and go, my soul is so refreshed? Now, there are things you can listen to and I can listen to or we can watch, songs we can listen to. Sure. But there's something going on in our world, and we can blame it on anyone we want to, but at the end of the day, we've got to look in the mirror. What do you want? What do you want to be true of you? What trajectory are you on? What path do you find yourself on when it comes to the endless hustle versus appropriate rest conversation? Where are you today? And what we tend to think about this rest work idea is, okay, Ben, maybe I don't have it right in this department of my life, but I'm still a strong Christian. Um, Listen, this rest conversation is about your entire life, and it's about your entire faith. It is a faith issue. You do know that, right? No, Ben, I just had this job. It's a faith issue. You do know, no, Ben, I just have five kids. It's a faith, and you've got to have some faith to have five kids, right? Like, it is a faith issue for sure for you. But guys, it's not simply rest or work, and then you do everything else the way God wants you to do. If you aren't able to rest, chances are it's because you're trying to gain an identity. And if you're trying to gain an identity, it means you haven't received to the depths and the core of who you are, the one that Jesus came to give you. If we don't, you'll see this on the screen, if we don't receive our identity from Jesus, it is likely that we will not receive our rest from him either. We need to quit domesticating Jesus and allowing him to do something for us on Sundays only. He wants your whole life. 
And he's got good intentions for your whole life. And if you're going to trust someone to secure your eternity, you might also want to adapt his rhythm of rest and work and rest and work. Some of us are like, yeah, I'm, you know, we don't say this, but we live this way. Like, we're trusting Jesus to hold our forever in place, but I'm not going to do what he tells me to do one day a week. Interesting. Interesting. Jesus offers this invitation in Matthew 11, 28 through 30. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. Anybody meet that condition? Yes. The rest of you nailed it with Will's one talk last week. So I don't even know why the series is still going. Here's the condition. All who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Here's an appropriate question coming out of Jesus' invitation. Who or what do you turn to when you're exhausted and weary? Don't say it out loud. You'll embarrass yourself. Who or what do you turn to when you're exhausted or weary? Five-hour energy? One of my friends after the 9 o'clock showed me that. He's like, you got me. Like, dude, whatever it takes you to stay awake in my sermons, awesome. I had to drink two to be able to speak to you today. So thank you very... He literally, he pulled it out after 9 o'clock. I'm like, yeah. Uh, what do you turn to? I mean, is it a certain substance? Is it a legal substance? Maybe an illegal substance? Is it vegging out with hours on Netflix? Is it you've got to take a vacation? Uh, is it that you've got to leave your job before you can get the kind of rest that you think that you need? Guys, some of those things I just mentioned will always be destructive to your soul, but even the good things that I mentioned, they can provide an environment conducive for rest, but none of those guarantee rest. Have you ever come back from a vacation and you felt like you needed a vacation? Yes. Because you can be, now environments matter. Let me say that wholeheartedly, environments matter, but there is no environment that you can be in that will guarantee you rest if you don't receive what God wants to give you in that space. You can, you can be in complete solitude, not actually doing work and still be consumed and paralyzed by your job. You know this. I know that you know this. I know this too. I was out this past week and, um, you know, the people that care about me, uh, one of them came this morning and said, hey, while you were gone, did you think about work? And um, to be honest, I think it was the like, healthiest uh, I've ever been being away from my work. I love work. I, I love work. And it almost felt like something was wrong with me because I wasn't consumed with it while I was gone. But then I started to say to my wife last night and to my friend this morning, hey, I think maybe I'm getting a little healthier in this area. How about you? Who or what do you turn to when you're just dying of exhaustion and you're weary? Jesus said, come to me. And you need to really pay attention to this. He doesn't give us six or seven options to find rest for our souls. He doesn't say, um, go take a walk. The walks are great. He doesn't say, go do some yoga. He doesn't say, go meditate. What does he say? Come to me, and I will give rest for your souls. But we tend to go after everything else. We don't feel like we can give ourselves permission to receive rest. Listen, God doesn't love us because we hustle. But some of us have built our entire identity on what we produce, achieve, and accomplish. God doesn't, like, you, some of you just need to be freed, because everyone else in your world, their love for you is conditioned upon your hustle, right? Anybody ever work for a boss? When you were killing it, you were the stuff. When you quit bringing the company money, did their love stay the same? God doesn't love us because we hustle, but some of us have built our entire identity on what we produce, achieve, and accomplish, and some of us, the reason we can't stop hustling is because we are such people pleasers. I'm a recovering-ish people pleaser. <clears throat> Criticize me after the message and I'll know how I'm doing with that. We've got to respond to every text within 13 seconds. We freak out if we haven't checked email in the last two and a half minutes. Some of you are checking it right now. You should listen. We... Just think that if we stop the hustle, then maybe someone else will surpass us. If we stop the hustle, maybe our boss won't be pleased with us. If we stop going after it, what's at stake? Do we have a self then? Because so many of us, we love to be needed. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I know so many of you in this room, like, you love to be needed, right? And some of that's okay. I, like, you want to have some purpose in life, right? Every, we, yeah, we like, saw just a little purpose. 
Um, there's a part of all of us, it's natural to want to be needed. In the early days of Epic, I was directly touching or involved in practically everything that we did. And I'll never forget the day came when I said to Shauna, I was like, I don't even feel like I'm needed up there anymore. But it was actually freeing. The same thing happens as a parent, right? Even if you're not a parent, you can imagine that this little human that needed you completely, one day they're not going to need you as much as they need you. If you're, if you're a healthy parent and that moment comes, you throw a party. <laughs> if you're an unhealthy parent, you parent them when they're 34 like they were four. Anybody, your parents still parent you like? Awesome. Yeah, camera is not going to, in case your mom or dad are watching, camera's not looking at any of you. We love to be needed. And we love... Not just to hustle, we love to be seen as someone who endlessly hustles. This is an issue for me. I told you, I love work, and it's true. But let me tell you how pathetic I am, how pathetic I was. I wish I could tell you this was two decades ago, but it was not that long ago. So when I would have a breakfast meeting early in the morning, before I I, I went to that breakfast meeting, you would think I would just leave my house and go straight to the restaurant where the breakfast meeting is. That's how you would do it, right? Not me. I need my team to know how much of a worker I am. So I'd go to the office pathetic. I would go to the office, put my bag down on my chair, get my computer out of my bag, plug my computer in. I've got to put the lid up, right? Right? And then I turned my lamp on so that whoever was the next person to come into the Epic Church office would know they weren't first. <laughs> Pilgrim was already on it. Pathetic. I told you. That's, I'm just telling you the truth. I got out of it by just starting to tell them at the end of the previous day, hey, just so you know, I'm going to be at a breakfast tomorrow morning, but I will already be working, okay? Because I just needed them to know, like, I'm willing to do it. I need to be seen as someone who is a hard worker in your eyes. I know, terrible. How did Jesus deal with the people-pleasing part? I mean, one of the hardest things is to live a high-demanding life, and I know so many of you do. How, how, How do you live a high demanding life and still make time for rest, renewal, refreshment, and restoration? How do you make time for it? In Mark chapter 1, verse 35 through 37, Mark says this about Jesus. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Now, some of us, the reason we never rest and take time off is because everyone is looking for us. But Jesus, in this moment where everyone is looking for him, he's praying in a slow, dark, quiet, solitary place. I know there's high demand on your life. There was a little bit of high demand on his life. Why can't we practice what he practiced when everyone was looking for him? Because we need everyone to be pleased with us. There's a verse in 1 Peter chapter 2 that has been incredibly freeing to me, and I would hope that it would grab your heart and your mind and free you from the stuff we're talking about today. Peter's going to write in this verse, I'll set the context He's going to talk about how when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he's being mocked, he's being ridiculed, he's being beaten. He's going to give the secret to why Jesus did not retaliate. Now, you might think, Ben, of course we know Jesus wouldn't retaliate. Jesus is completely loving. He is, but that's not what Peter says. Ben, Jesus won't retaliate because he's going to forgive the very people that are killing him. Because some of you know that one of his prayers on the cross is what? Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Peter doesn't say that. What does Peter say in 1 Peter 2.23? Listen to it. It's freed me from the whole thing we're talking about today. Here's what it says. When they hurled insults at him, Jesus, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He did not retaliate. Why? He made no threats. How come? Because he was entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Do you know that refusing to defend yourself is a form of rest? Some of you, you, like, this is the whole message for you right here. Refusing to prove yourself is a form of rest. Anybody else, when someone says, like, they they evaluate you wrong and you, like, it's a quarterly performance, you didn't get the job, someone else got the promotion, don't you, in your mind, think of a two-hour conversation you could have to prove them wrong? Right? 
Why does Jesus keep his mouth shut? Is it because he's not in pain? Oh, no. Is it because they're right in what they're saying? I mean, they're saying to him, you saved everyone else. Why can't you save yourself? They said to him, you're the king of the Jews. He is. Why does he shut up during this moment? Because he wasn't entrusting himself to who they said he was. The reason you and I don't stop, the reason you and I won't shut up when it's time for us to prove ourselves is because we're entrusting ourselves to the wrong person. Who are you entrusting yourself to? Let me give you some obvious ones. Boss, parents, some leader here at Epic, person you wish you could date, your industry, Who are you entrusting yourself to? Because whoever you entrust yourself to, that's who you are dependent upon to give you a name, to give you an identity, to let you know when you've made it, to let you know that you've been approved of. Who are you entrusting yourself to? Lynn Babb in her book Sabbath Keeping says this, only in stopping, really stopping, do we teach our hearts and souls that we are loved apart from what we do. So we're like, Ben, I know that I'm loved by God. Then why can't you stop? The reason some of us can't stop is because if we stop, we don't know if we have a self or not. I could be speaking to a different group of people today somewhere else in the country or even the world, and um, they wouldn't struggle with the kinds of things maybe that we struggle with. Most of us, including myself, we are much more comfortable working than resting. While Shauna and I were away last week, she's like, I think you've only sat still for about 10 minutes at a time. It's like improvement. I was like, walking for me is sitting still. Thank you very much. Who are you entrusting yourself to? Who gets to define you? Who gets to hold sway over your life? Who is the weightiest opinion in your world? Why? And please, this is, don't, don't give me that, Ben. I've got to keep my job. So I, Same for me. Same for me. You need to work. You need to hustle. But not for a name. Not for your well-being. Not for an identity. Not to know that you're okay. And speaking of stopping, to know that we're just loved apart from what we do, for almost a year now, our team has been planning our focus retreat, a retreat that's really going to be about everything we're talking about today. And so it's not just an announcement today. It's actually message application. And 12 o'clock, we've got some space left. And I know you're like, Ben, I, I... I heard that the Saturday session is going to start before noon. It is. You're not going to be in trouble. Nobody's going to come wake you up if you miss it. All right? We want to create space for you to stop and for your soul to be filled. Now, we may sit around the campfire talking till 2 a.m. in the morning. Your body will be tired the next morning, no doubt, but your soul might be filled up. And I don't want to sound too mystical about this, but I believe in that space in the Redwoods, May 17th through 19th, I believe God's going to meet with us. And I want you to be present when we do it. Because solitude isn't just about being away by myself. It can be very much a communal thing as well. And can you imagine what we're going to experience together? And you know, so much of us, our hustling is because everyone else around us is hustling. If you're hustling and doing endless work while we're at the retreat, we're going to make fun of you. Seriously, like you will have to get behind a big redwood to send an email for work. And we're going to find out. Right? It's a retreat. Right? And some of you are like, Ben, the reason I'm not going is because I just don't want to do the bunk bed thing. Stop it. Stop. Um, Your soul will thank you. And I really believe that. And you need to know this. I don't need you to sign up for my sake. I'm there already. I'm there. I don't know, 360 of us so far. Spots will fill up. We would love for you to go. And what I want to ask you to do, even right now, is to text this. Focus retreat. Don't check an email. Just focus retreat. Text to 313131, one word, lowercase. Tell yourself the truth about why you're not going if you aren't. See if that sticks. See if it's valid. Ask me if you're not sure. Guys, there is not a one-to-one correlation between your productivity and your worth as a person. I don't care what you've been called. I don't care what's been promised to you if you just won't stop. I'm a performer by nature, so I want to say this again because some of you are like me. There is not a one-to-one correlation between your productivity and your worth as a person. 
God wants to speak a better, more defining word over your identity, but the invitation is yours. You can receive the identity he wants to confer upon you as a daughter or a son, or you can keep striving for your own. But the endless hustle hasn't won you a secure identity yet. What makes you think it will do so in the future? But here's one that has. 1 John 3, 1 says, See what great love the Father has lavished upon us, that we should be called the children of God. That is what we are. The more I talk to some of you, I'm convinced that when you call yourself a Christian, what you mean by that, I think, from my conversations with you, sometimes you simply mean that that's the religion that you most identify with. And like, that, that's cool, but I want you to know what a Christian is just based off of the talk this morning. A Christian is a person, man, woman, boy, or girl, who has entrusted themselves fully to the God who created them. And if that's never been done by you, I don't want us to leave this noon gathering until you have the chance to do so. Have you entrusted yourself to the God who created you, to the God who made a way through his perfect son's death on a cross for you to enter in? I know you're striving for a name. He wants to confer one on you. I know you would love to go earn it. We love to have a list to go earn. Anybody? You give me a list of 25 things, we're done by dinner. I'm in. Instead, I've got to receive, and you've got to receive. Who are you entrusting yourself to? And whoever that is, it won't help you if you're not honest with yourself, at least. Whoever you're entrusting yourself to for your identity, are they worth it? Is your boss worth it? Is that guy or girl worth it? Is your industry worth it? Is your social media platform worth it? Is it worth it? I think in that moment for Jesus, he kept entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He's just going, no matter what they say, I know who I am. No matter what they do, even if they kill me, I know who I am and whom I belong to. I believe Jesus would constantly go back to his own baptism when he comes up out of the water, heaven's open, and the Father's voice says this, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. If you've never heard that spoken over your own life, today would be a beautiful day to move into it. And if you have, and you know that you're securely at a place where you've trusted your life to Jesus, I know you're tempted to keep trusting it to someone else, to let someone else's opinion of you matter more than his, but you have a definitive voice over your life. Don't settle for less than that voice. Would you pray with me? God, thank you so much for today. Thank you that you've given us a, 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 sh a more sure name God, you've given us something that won't go away when our success at work goes away. God, you've given us a firm identity that doesn't move when our success or, or, or when we, even when we retire. God, you are the God who doesn't love us because we hustle. You love us because we belong to you. And when we brought you nothing to the table, God, you as a heavenly father, you lavish your love on us. God, so many people in this room or living by a formula, I am loved as long as I produce. I am loved as long as I make profits for the company. I am loved as long as they think all I do is work, work, work. God, would you come and free us from that? And then you guys, I was reading this week in Psalm 139. It's a great psalm about how God's so familiar with all of our ways. And I got to verse 17 and 18 and it, it said this. It says, how precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. Just think about that first line. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How precious to me are, are your thoughts. How valuable are your thoughts. Whose thoughts about you do you value most? If you can't rest, it's probably not God's. <laughs> because he's wanting to tell you, hey, listen, I'm... Rest like I've invited you to rest, and I'll hold the world up while you rest. I want to ask you to stand with me, and in just a moment, these guys are going to lead us in a song that I think is, I think it's powerful. I think it resonates with what we've been talking about. But there's a line in the bridge that says, I will rest in the Father's hands, and then I'll leave the rest in the Father's hands. It's kind of these two pieces of faith that say, I will rest, God, in your hands, but I also believe that you will take care of the rest. Yesterday, I had a phone call with a young man, 
in our community, and he said, Ben, I want some career advice. And here's what he said to me. He said, whatever you think the best advice is from a godly perspective, I promise you I'll take it. He said, I'll have, a, I'll have the faith to take it. But then he said this, but I know that if I don't take the job, if I'm not supposed to take the job and God doesn't want me to, it's, it's going to ruin my career. Now, I loved his faith on the front end, right? Whatever God wants me to do, I'm in. God wants me to rest, I'll rest. But he had an absence of faith on the back end when he said, but if I do what God tells me to do, I'm going to ruin my future. No, 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 no. And I called him. I said, listen, the faith that will allow you to do the right move today in the God who provides today, that faith will be, needs to be also in a God who will provide tomorrow. So when we sing the song, when we say this, God, I will rest. I, I will do it. Some of us are going, okay, God, I will rest, but then so-and-so is going to be more productive and they're going to get a better whatever. And God wants to go, um, no, if I tell you to rest and you do what I say, I'm not going to like, you know, ruin you because you did what I said. So Jesus said in Matthew 6, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, righteousness, and then what? All of these things, the rest, will be added unto you. This is a faith issue. It's not just a practice issue. It's not just a work issue. It's not just a I'm so important issue. This is a faith issue. And so let's declare this as Zach and the team lead us. 